All right, welcome back to The Hub. Uh, today's guest is Dr. Arden Pope. Um, Dr. Pope is a professor at BYU. Uh, I actually used to, I TA'd his Econ 110 class. Uh, supposedly, if you want to get an A in Econ 110 at BYU, you take Dr. Pope. Uh, <laughs> if you want to get a C or lower, you take Dr. Curl. Um, but the learning and the, the level of learning is the same. So people always want to take Dr. Pope is what that's, that was the rumor around, uh, you know, freshman and sophomore uh, students at BYU. So, <laughs> uh, and then, yeah, I did a little RA work for, uh, Dr. Pope as well. Um, so yeah, um, Dr. Pope Arden, if there's anything else you'd like to introduce yourself or, you know, maybe get a little background. No, I, I mean, I will tell you that, uh, Jim Curl and myself gave exactly the same distribution, so exactly the same number of A's. But I, but I do think it's, I do think it's true that uh, that uh, you know that there was this perception that I gave more A's, but I didn't. Oh, okay. Let's say still, still <laughs> correcting me. You know, ten years after after I yeah. graduated. Well, years when you after need graduate. correction, that's the way it works. <laughs> no, that's great. Um, I still remember one of our earliest discussions. Uh, well, the earliest, one of your earliest discussions about economics and about scarcity and how people have to make choices. And that's like what economics is all about: is how do you allocate scarce resources? And we talked about uh oxygen in the air and uh you talked about um I, I forget like the actual scenario but something like oh if there's only like 10 people who can survive like wh how do we how do we do it? how do we decide who stays alive who doesn't or, and uh, who can breathe the air and who couldn't uh and i remember being like yeah this is this is a tough question you know and then you applied it to other stuff and you talked about other markets and uh you talked about you know organ donations, you know, we don't let the market decide everything. In some instances, we, you know, we put, remember those discussions and whatnot. So, excellent, but. Um, so yeah, uh, so Dr. Pope, why don't you talk a little bit about what your focus of research is? Um, so I, I mean, my, my training actually originally was in agricultural economics and uh, then I did, then I did uh, work in economics and statistics, but about almost approximately 30 years ago, I got involved in sort of a little hobby project, basically Geneva Steel shut down for 13 months and then reopened. And there was a lot of sort of anecdotal evidence that not only did the meal have an impact on, on air pollution, but also had an impact on health. And so I ended up doing a, a project, basically a very, very straightforward natural experiment where Geneva Steel shut down and then reopened. And we had information on air pollution. And then we collected information retrospectively on on children's respiratory hospital admissions and evaluated uh, the, the impact of Geneva Steel on both pollution and children's health. And we ended up getting this remarkably sort of large health effect, which sort of demanded more study. And so what started out as sort of a hobby project ended up, ended up uh, being sort of a, a big change in, in uh, you know, sort of research agenda. I started working with uh, colleagues at, at Harvard, the Harvard Med School and School of Public Health. Uh, got very involved doing interdisciplinary work on sort of the, the, the health effects of air pollution on both respiratory health and cardiovascular health. And more recently, I've been looking a lot at, at, at cancer. Um, so, uh, over a period of about 30 years now, I've looked at the health effects of air pollution from a wide variety of, uh, of different perspectives and using different methodological approaches and using different data sets and, and, and really truly trying to, to, to understand to what degree air pollution contributes to adverse health outcomes and what we can do about it. 
Yeah, I, I, I remember you talking about, well, thanks for that. I remember you talking about, uh, you know, after the Geneva Steel study, uh, which resulted in, well, correct me if I'm wrong, but resulted in Geneva Steel having to shut back down later because of the pollution, is that correct? Yeah, well, yeah, some, sometimes people will say it was our research that actually shut Geneva Steel down. I don't think that would be true at all. Uh, they continued to running for quite some time. They objected to our research and, and the results, uh, but, they, but they did, uh, you know, they were required to put more controls on the steel mill. And then over time, uh, the price of steel just did not justify their costs. And I don't know how much, I don't know how much pollution control played a role there but they did eventually shut down just because, hey, that old steel mill just wasn't profitable anymore. Yeah, and for those that might not, might not be aware with Utah landscape or the surrounding, Geneva Steel was, I think, a World War II initially steel mill built to help yeah. build, uh, I think, steel plates for Navy ships or, uh, anyways, this is really old steel mill that, you know, was built in the 50s and I uh, operated for quite a while. And then, uh, yeah, like you said, it was an old steel mill and had, you know, quite a bit of pollution. So you can imagine retrofitting uh, pollution controls would have been expensive and, you know, costly. It was an efficient steel plant, basically. Uh, and then, uh, but the point was, is after that study, I remember you talking about how you connected up with Harvard professors and uh, at the med school and uh, some other people and you did this nationwide study that looked at health and air pollution, right? It wasn't it like <clears throat> help yeah, fill so in we, the gaps here. It was we like did a, we, we did a series of studies. Uh, probably the most famous one was the Harvard Six City study, and in fact, it had been designed and the data had been collected, and, and most of the work had been done even before I started working with them but I, I was lucky enough to be able to collaborate with them on, on, on data analysis and, and interpreting the results of that study, the so-called Harvard Six City study. And, uh, and it, it, it was really quite remarkable. It, 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 it found that fine particulate air pollution was strongly associated with, with the risk of mortality, especially respiratory and cardiovascular mortality. And in fact, even before we sent that paper to, to, to publish it, we were concerned that these results um, were, were really stronger than what, what we anticipated. And so at that point, we, we actually connected with the American Cancer Society, and they had a, a large cohort that they had collected from all over the United States. And we, we agreed with them, or they agreed with us that they would share their data collaborate with us, link their data with air pollution data and analyze it similar to what we did with the Harvard Six City study. But the ACS cohort now is much, much larger. It's uh, throughout the United States. It has you know, hundreds of thousands of participants versus just thousands. And, uh, and, and, and in the end, when we, when we did the analysis on that, and it was, it was a fascinating study, we got results similar to what we got from the Harvard Six City study. And so those two studies were kind of like companion studies, or at least studies that sort of um, validated each other. We published those in the, in the mid-1990s. And, uh, and that you know, that they were, they were very influential because they were sort of the first studies that demonstrated that long-term chronic exposure to air pollution can substantially increase your risk of, of, of dying. Uh, and, 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 and that's especially too, true with respiratory and cardiovascular disease. Now, I'll make, make something very clear. Of course, of course, we understand that your, your risk of dying it's basically 100% for most people. We eventually die. But what these studies are really doing is they're looking at what is your risk of dying at a given time period, conditional upon living to that time period, and controlling for a whole bunch of other things. And of course, we know we're going to eventually die, but we don't want to die in this time period or the next time period, the next time period. We want to, 
reduced our, reduce our risk of dying in any given time period, which ultimately will mean that we have longer life expectancy and a longer life with better health. And what we found is, is that uh, air pollution uh, contributes to the risk of getting cardiovascular and respiratory disease, uh, making our lives less healthy and making them shorter. Do you, would you, do you know, like on average, like how many years uh, does, I, and I know there's different levels, right? Not air pollution is not the same throughout. And so the effect's going to be different, but like on average, let's say medium to a place like Utah, uh, the air pollution, like what effect does that have on life expectancy? Is it one year, two years, five years? Yeah. So to help put that into perspective, uh, a sort of an average smoker smoking a pack or two of cigarettes a day uh, throughout their adult lifetime will have a loss of life expectancy somewhere around maybe seven to 10 years, about eight years loss of life expectancy. This is a, this is a smoker relative to a never smoker sort of controlling for other factors. So uh, a loss of life expectancy of eight years is, is very, very large. I mean, one of, the, one of the most damaging things that you can do to your health is smoke cigarettes on a daily basis throughout, throughout your adult life. So, so think of eight years as sort of a benchmark from active smoking. Mm. If uh, our estimates in some of the most polluted cities in the world, so cities like in Northern India, some of the most uh, polluted Chinese cities, you might have a loss of life expectancy in the neighborhood of around uh, three years, okay? Um, now, when you go to average pollution along the Wasatch Front in Utah, the reality is, is compared to some of these really polluted cities in Northern India and things, it's quite clean. Uh, so average pollution in, in Salt Lake or in the Provo area, uh, is only about 11, 12 micrograms per cubic meter. The problem, of course, in Utah is what we have is we have a lot of variability over time. Uh, so most of the time it's relatively clean, but then during these bad inversions, yeah. we'll have um, really bad air pollution. So on average, um, the Utah air is, is reasonably clean and the loss of life expectancy is not going to be super high. But what we do see is that um, uh, during these really bad episodes, bad inversion episodes, the increased risk of having severe adverse health outcomes such as uh, uh, acute respiratory infection or even uh, acute coronary artery disease, things like heart attacks, uh, they are elevated in a substantial way during those episodes of high air pollution. But thank heavens we don't have air pollution year round yeah. comparable to what we have during those episodes of high air pollution. So, so directly answering your question, what would be the loss of life expectancy for Utah it would be something quite low, uh, it, you know, something in the order of months versus something like three or four years in the most polluted cities of the world and something like eight to 10 years for active smoking, uh, you know, moderate to heavy smoking throughout your adult life. Yeah. Well, uh, two, two thoughts on that. One, it's, it's super interesting, like the environment, you know, the stuff that you breathe, like has an impact on, on your health. And that might be obvious to some people, but to other people, like, uh, it's like, wow, like, you know, maybe there's cause for concern. Maybe there's uh, something we need to do, you know, from a public policy perspective to mitigate, mitigate against that risk. Of. And then the other one is, I just, you know, as you were talking, I was reminded of a friend, uh, him and his wife had their, I think it was their second child. And, you know, it's tough to say, you know, whether this was genetic or, you know, the air pollution or whatnot, but it was a newborn. And I remember it was during the winter months and it was during this time of, you know, heavy inversion. 
and she, their kid, she just, it felt like she had a ton of problems with like respiratory issues. Like she kept having to go back to the hospital. And I was always like, huh, I wonder if like, you know, the air and, you know, if, if the inversion is having an effect on, you know, her ability to breathe. And this was a, a newborn baby, you know, they'd taken yeah. her home out of the hospital. And uh, so, yeah, I mean, there's, there's definitely, I guess what I'm trying to say is there's some cost here uh, that affect everybody and not just like, it's not like a Geneva steel can just produce and, you know, uh, this cost is the cost of production is being dispersed to, to, you know, to the population around it. Well, yeah, you're, you're, you're right. I mean, there, there's sort of two points you made there. One, one with regards to this, this child, uh, little girl, right? Um, she, you know, we, we've done, we've done a number of studies. A few years ago, we actually looked at, at uh, respiratory uh, infections. And so focus, initially we were focused on respiratory syncytial virus, which really affects young children, infant kids. But what we found is, is that, that it was worse when, you ha when they were also exposed to air pollution. Uh, and so we, we know that air pollution contributes to the exacerbation of, and even the initiation of disease in both children and, and adults. Now, then your other point was, is a lot of this, you know, you talk about some of the things that we do have costs that we, that we as economists refer to as externality costs or externalities. And, yep. um, and so uh, industries that pollute our air in a serious way, whether it be a steel mill or whether it be a coal-fired power, power plant or whether it be just a, a massive amounts of, of poorly controlled automobiles or trucks or whatever, um, these do impose a cost upon society. And one of those uh, important costs have to do with, uh, with adverse health effects. And um, to ignore those costs uh, is, is, is not wise. Uh, to do good uh, economic allocation of resources, you know, to, to do a good job as economists, we have to recognize those costs and, and and uh, allocate our resources in such a way that we sort of can minimize the, the costs and, and sort of maximize the benefits. And if we completely ignore the costs, that's a problem. Uh, you had mentioned, well, uh, I mean, that's a great example. And costs to the health of our children, those are about as big a cost as you can think of, clearly. Uh, they are important. And when, when you actually, start to take a look at the impacts of air pollution on health. There's, there's a study called the Global Burden of Disease Report or Global Burden of Disease Study, where they evaluate the various risk factors that contribute to burden of disease. The latest Global Burden of Disease suggests that, uh, study suggests that air pollution is the fifth largest risk factor contributing to global burden of disease in the world. Now think about that. That has a big impact on, on the health of people throughout the world. And when you think of economics as being the, the academic discipline that deals with the allocation of scarce resources to meet human needs and objectives, what human need and objective is more important to us than our life and our health and the life and health of our children? Yeah, I totally agree. It, it's, you know, it's, interesting bringing up the point of children because children like let's say this disease they get you know initiated or exacerbated exacerbates some sort of true for someone who's older or uh i guess that cost is magnified when it's uh happens at a young age, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So I guess, so, so, uh, you know, so there's this externality, there's this extra cost that's not being fully calculated, uh, you know, in the producer side, you know, Geneva Steel when they're making this, um, and this cost is borne by the rest of us. 
so what would you say would be some policy prescriptions to like to, to deal with this, to incorporate this cost? And I will say, you know, classic economics uh, would say like, you know, one of the reasons why this cost isn't fully incorporated in the production process is because, you know, property rights aren't well defined. Like the property right to breathe air, like no one has like, it's not like you can go straight up from your house and say, okay, this section of sky above my house is my property right. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> there's there, there, that concept doesn't exist for air, for sky, because if it did, then you could say, okay, you know, this is infringing upon my property right. Here's the amount of it. Like now I can tax uh, the steel mill to pay for the, the damage to, to my property. Yeah. Um, so barring that, you know, how, you know, what, what, what can Utah do? What, what can we do for, you know, to clean up our air? Well, there's a couple of ways to think of think of this, and I'll 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 I'll, I'll sort of separate the way I, the way I discuss it. First off, when you talk about public policies, I mean you can sort of list them. I mean, first you can just do nothing, and if you do nothing, then basically what we do is we get um, more pollution than we want. We get these externalities. We get costs of our pollution greater than than would be optimal for society. A second thing we can do is sort of what's often referred to as moral suasion. That is, try to talk people into not polluting or at least reducing their pollution. Uh, you know, there's just, just try our very best to say, you know, give a hoot, don't pollute kind of, kind of. <laughs> uh, ride, your, ride your bike more kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, you know, so that's exactly right. It, it turns out that those two approaches may, you know, the do nothing obviously doesn't help much and the moral suasion might help some. And then, then another approach, and you mentioned property rights, another approach we, we can use is try to have new and improved property rights. Try to have property rights that are such that we, in, we, we do internalize the externalities. And that's often sometimes very, very hard to do. It certainly is hard to do with our air. It's hard to put fences around the air and that sort of thing. So right. often the new and improved property right approaches would be something more like a sort of the cap and trade approaches. So you sort of cap the amount of emissions that can that will be allowed and then you have to have a trans you have to have permits and you allow those permits to be transferable. And then what what's nice about that is you get this sort of uh, pseudo market oriented allocation of the of, of the right to to pollute and then you try to have uh, a cap in pollution such that you you have you know a cap on pollution that's about sort of socially optimal amount of pollution that's a very that's not an easy thing to do and these cap and trade schemes have been been developed and probably need to be developed more and used more and then there's another approach that's sort of similar to that it's what we often refer to as Pigouvian taxes. Uh, that's where you sort of tax the externality, you tax the pollution, and you try to calibrate the tax uh, in such a way that you get uh, closer to socially optimal levels of pollution. And then, of course, there's the solution that we've been using. The primary thing we've done with regards to most of our, our, our sort of typical pollutants is we've done uh, regulation. So we, you know, we, we basically have these regulatory standards that have to be met. In the United States, we've established what are called national ambient air quality standards. And then we require the states to come into compliance with those standards. And the states then impose regulations on industry, on automobiles, on space heating, on various sources that contribute to the pollution. And, uh, and we, we, we use this sort of regulatory approach to, to improve our air quality. And, 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 and I, can, I could give examples of, of all of those approaches of, and where sometimes they've worked well and other places where they haven't worked well, but, but those are the kind of public policy approaches that we, we could use. Um, now, on the other hand, you could say, well, maybe we just said reduce the pollution by ourselves. But of course, we can't very well. 
we all breathe the same air shed. Um, so, so the most effective strategies are strategies where we as a community or where, where, where we as a society make choices together to, um, to deal with these, with these problems. We as individuals can try to limit our exposure by, you know, having HEPA filters in our homes maybe, or by when we go out and exercise, we try to get up above the inversion layer and exercise above it and never exercise on a busy street, that kind of thing. There's various things that we can do as individuals, uh, but the most effective thing we can do is work together as a society to um, find strategies that, that, that actually allow us to breathe together uh, cleaner air. What, what would you say to people though that, uh, I guess maybe put another way, how, how do you balance, you know, the, the cost of, you know, putting forth the community um, approach with, you know, letting people, you know, still live and still, uh, still move around. <laughs> and I, yeah, I guess, how would you, and I, what I'm, I guess what I'm trying to say is like, you know, I know, like, I've heard solutions of like, okay, you know, you get a permit to drive on a day, but you basically break up traffic where people can drive on a days, and other people can only drive on B days. And that kind of, you know, what we've seen in the pandemic, right, when there was basically no traffic, you know, everyone shut down, the air in these cities, especially in LA got a lot cleaner. And so, you know, it's like, well, what if we like just restrict movement, you know, like, you can only if you have an A day, like you can drive only on A days. And if you have a B day, you can only drive on B day. But like that really restricts you know, yeah. people's movement. So like, how, how do you balance those two? And I realize that's just like one example, but. Well, I mean, that's, that's an example. And I, I think it's a good example of probably a bad policy. Um, uh, it's certainly not a particularly efficient way to deal with the air pollution by going to A and B days and, and restricting driving like that. I mean, we'd be better off. We're almost certainly better off to, uh, to, to try to find ways to actually be mobile without polluting. And this is not very far-fetched anymore. Uh, yeah. Uh, we, we are, there, there are already huge differences in, in the amount of emissions coming out of vehicles. In fact, our vehicles have cleaned up a lot. Man, in my lifetime, I remember, remember in the 1960s, 1970s, I mean, the amount of emissions <laughs> vehicles was way greater than today, but we are we are very quickly getting to the point where I suppose my grandkids at some point are going to talk to each other. You know, our grandpapa he drove this he drove this car that had an internal combustion engine and and had incomplete combustion, so they put their pollutants out of tailpipe and then they drove around on the road sniffing each other's tailpipes, you know, and 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 being exposed to the pollution <laughs> and walking on site. This will seem crazy at, at some point in time, uh, uh, how much we, we pollute just from being mobile. Being mobile would be good, but we are, I think, I think, I don't know that we are at the tipping point yet, but we're getting close to the tipping point where the idea of driving vehicles that are such large polluters will just not make any sense. I, I don't know exactly yeah. what the technology will be, but we should be we should be supportive of technology for for mobility that's super clean. I mean, imagine a, a large skateboard with four electric motors on each wheel, um, a, a good battery pack, and a and a comfortable confi configured seats on the top, and a computer to run it all. I mean, that's 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 future transportation. Yeah, and it it's not an an internal combustion engine that wastes so much energy and pollutes so much. Uh, similar kind of thing with our homes. Uh, I mean, I imagine that we're talking about someday where we're generating much of our electricity with solar, uh, you know, panel style roofs, uh, maybe windows. 
also generate electricity with a battery pack in our basement that stores electricity for a few days. So we, we, we have it over time. Uh, we, may, we may actually at some point not even need an electronic grid the way we have because we can generate power uh, fairly inexpensively. Right now, you know, I, I saw an article just a couple of days ago that suggested that in terms of generating electricities, electricity, uh, building uh, a solar paneled, you know, generation site is actually now about as cheap as any 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 other form of electrical generation. So the you know I I I actually think that we we should be going that direction. And most economists would argue that we really should be taxing some sort of a Bogubian tax on on pollution. May, you know sometimes referred to as a carbon tax. Uh, and of course that gets us off into another area as well. But uh, that we should be sort of taxing, uh, you know, the pollution and sort of, if we want to subsidize, let's subsidize the cleaner forms of transportation. And I just have no objections to us being both mobile and non-polluting. That's the direction we ought to be heading for. And I, and, and I really truly believe that um, with a concerted effort and reasonable public policy, uh, we can move that direction uh, fairly soon. And in fact, it wasn't, I was, it wasn't that long ago where we're talking about having solar panel uh, or, or solar, so, uh, solar generated electricity being cheaper than coal would have sounded, uh, sounded absurd. But yeah. right now we're seeing our, our coal fired power plants are actually in decline. Um, and of course, a lot of that has to do with, with natural gas, which is, which is certainly cleaner than coal, but has its own issues with regards to fracking and things. But the bottom line is, is we must have a, 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 an economic strategy that recognizes all of the costs and all of the benefits and allows us to basically be mobile, be productive, et cetera, while we are being cleaner. Now look at the United States. We decided to really tackle the air pollution problem starting in about the early 1970s with the Clean Air Act of 1970 and, and the establishment of the EPA. And we've dramatically reduced the amount of emissions of air pollutants in the United States over the last 50, 60 years. What's happened to our economy? It must have destroyed it, right? <laughs> Not really. <laughs> Not really. Our economy has continued to grow over that same time period, our GDPs roughly doubled. Uh, you know, we we can uh, have a cleaner, better, more vibrant, uh, e uh, you know, economy, while at the same time we improve our environment. And in fact, we should start to think of our of environmental amenities as being basically just economic goods. We should yeah. have air. I mean. Uh, good air quality, clean air is something that's good for our economy, it's good for our health, it's good for humans. That's, th that's exactly the kind of thing that a, a good economic system should provide, something that's really good for us. And um, so we, we should no longer be thinking of environment versus the economy. We should be thinking of putting them together. Economic choices include environmental amenities that are, that are good for humans. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah, I agree. I think there's, I think it's just a cost store that needs to be incorporated. And I, you, I think I find a lot of businesses starting to incorporate, uh, you know, their economic, uh, their env not economic, their environmental footprint. They're being more aware of it, and I think some of that has to do with like the focus, you know, conversation. But also, I think like, yeah, they just, you know, want to be more environmental more sustainable, I guess is one way to phrase it. And uh, yeah, I think the right mix of, I don't wanna say public, yeah, public awareness, uh, government response, as well as private innovation, uh, you know, as those move forward together, I really feel like, like you said, we can, you know, 20, 30 years down the, down the road, look and be like, yeah, look, we still grew our economy and now we're in a much cleaner environment as well. That's right. I agree. 
and you're seeing it too right? i mean you're seeing it with elon musk and you know tesla and like i know there's issues there like with the rare earth metals and power generation you know still generates you know electricity but i mean like you mentioned natural gas like it just seems like yeah there's things going that way uh and yeah we can well i sure hope so i mean there i think there's there's reason to be pessimistic uh and and that and part of that is because it, it seems like some of the most reasonable public policy approaches seem to be politically impact you know impossible right now but there are approaches there are approaches that will work that will help us you know deal with these issues and so i'm i'm optimistic that at some point in time we're going to start to say look, look at let's deal with our air pollution problem let's deal with our greenhouse gas the greenhouse gas issues and the you know and the and issues related to climate change and 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 let's, let's just deal with them away in a way that makes sense but it but it does require us to work together this whole idea that i mean you talked about the the, the issue of the freedom and we you know we ought to be able to be able to be free to pollute if we want well that that's just we just ought, need to understand that there have always been resource constraints freedom at least in a, a, a you know free markets free enterprise uh really requires at some point that we recognize the constraints we recognize the scarcities that exist and we deal with those those constraints and those scarcities and um and i and, and, you know I, I do really i do really think that we can do it but only only until we you know for example with air pollution we have to think about the idea that polluting our air should not be thought of a freedom any more than than running your household sewer into the local water uh you know supply for your community nobody would think that that's a freedom that we should have yeah nor should we be running our our, our, our our pollution into the air that we breathe and one of the things that we've learned from from public health is that yes modern medicine is great and it helps our health but the most important things for our human health is adequate food adequate nutritious food good clean adequate water yeah. and good clean air i mean food water and air what we what we eat what we breathe what we drink really has a huge impact on our health and to to sort of say ah we we need to let everybody be free to maybe pollute somebody else's water or somebody else's food or somebody else's air just doesn't just doesn't make sense and so we have public policies that say let's let's assure that our food supply is not is not tainted it's not poisoned that it's that that it's that it's a healthy safe food supply we should do that with our water supply we should do that with the air that we breathe as well yeah i think yeah i agree i mean you got to incorporate the cost right and that's uh as you incorporate the cost uh you know and you allow the market to kind of allocate once it's incorporated that cost you'll find a new optimal you know and i i'm more of a free market you know i believe in markets that allocate efficiently uh but yeah you got to you have to incorporate the cost is basically what you're saying and That's it's, right. it's foolish to ignore the cost and say like you said you're restricting my freedom here because it's a cost and you know we've already shown we're willing to put in regulation put in some restrictions for food and water hey the air should be included as well 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 you know very well that in economics we have if, if you ignore the costs of an externality you end up with this big deadweight loss yep well when you do these studies of air pollution and you learn that air pollution contributes to the risk of disease and death that sort of gives another definition of deadweight loss uh, it's real these losses are real and they need to they need to be dealt with now i will admit i mean it's it's very clear that it is not as easy 
as just saying, all right, let's just do a better job of defining and enforcing property rights because property rights in air and in, in water and some things, things are harder, um, but we still have to do it or, or we're going to continue to, 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 to face these so-called dead weight dead loss. loss. That, that's a good way to put it, the dead weight loss. Think of it in terms of the health cost of your population and those health costs come back around because you know we have Medicaid, we have Medicare, you know, the government is involved. We, we're all paying the health costs, you know, through premiums yeah. or other way. So that, that's a good way to put it. Uh, well, Dr. Pope, you know, we're wrapping up here. Uh, you know, thanks for coming on. Uh, I guess one last thing I wanted to kind of bring up, and th- th- maybe this is how I view it, uh, and this could be wrong, but for me, like, you know, when I think of climate change, you know, the earth is, you know, studies shown the earth is getting warmer, human activity, how much does it contribute to it? You know, that's still up for debate. Uh, you know, what can we do about it? That's also up for debate. In my mind, I think of, you know, hey, if we can clean up our air and what goes into it, in my mind, that's already going quite a bit into solving climate change. And what I mean by that is, you know, if our mobility is much more environmentally, you know, efficient, safe, uh, you know, our power generation is, you know, cleaner for the air. In my mind, I feel like that's a small piece, but a very important piece that can solve the larger problem of climate change. Is that is that kind of a good way to think about it, or is that too narrow of a scope? Well, I, th- I think it's true, but only in part. I mean, it doesn't f- fully address all the issues. It's, it, you know, it, it's, it's, it's very clear that many of the greenhouse gases and many of the, what we often refer to as criteria pollutants uh, that, that contribute directly to these adverse health effects we've been looking at, it's true that they often come from the same sources and the same activities. Yeah. And so when we control those sources for, for, for one objective, maybe to improve our health, it likely will have a, a, a positive impact in terms of reducing the amount of greenhouse gas emissions. This isn't, it, not perfectly, but it'll help some. And, and the reverse is true too, as we try to reduce the, the, the emissions that really contribute to greenhouse gases, mm-hmm. that also will have a positive impact in terms of the, the pollutants that we're exposed to that, 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 that hurt our health. Now, and so doing one will help the other and vice versa. But being <laughs> sort of being more strategic and smarter about it and recognizing the costs from both will, yeah. even, will, will even do a better job. And um, I will admit that we probably have a better handle on the real uh, substantial health effects costs of the air pollution better than we fully understand the costs of climate change and and, and all of the ramifications that are gonna go on there. But I don't think there's very much, um, well, I I think that the the, the evidence that um, climate change is happening and that it's largely driven by uh, human activities that are changing the, the, the concentrations of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. I think that that is, is now a very, very compelling story. Uh, the evidence is, is there. What, and, and I don't think there's any doubt that it, that will come with substantial costs. The real, the real doubts kind of are how big are those costs going to be? Will they be just sort of something minor that we can adapt to and adjust to and, and move along fine as, as, as humans? Or will they be catastrophic? And, and I'm, not, I'm not pretending that I know the answer to that. There are some economists that basically argue that there's, gonna, there, there's fat tails in the distribution of how bad, uh, <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. On, on, on one end, it could be, catastrophic and have mass barren, barren wasteland across earth kind of exactly thing. i'm not sure barren wasteland <laughs> just, well, it might be huge and if there and, and if that's the case we may think in terms of 
of dealing with, with greenhouse gas emissions and that sort of thing as a, think of it more as an insurance policy, an insurance policy against some catastrophic impact. And then there are others that say, eh, the impacts might be big, but they're so far into the future, by the time we discount them, it's not worth doing anything. So you have that, that, that you know, that's sort of the economic range of arguments. On the one hand, I mean, you discount the costs to a generation or two by, even if you just have a discount rate of, of just three or four or five percent, that means basically you discount something over 50 years and we don't really hardly care about it. Right. And, and that's the problem, unlike, unlike air pollution and health, where the effects are basically immediate, the, the impacts of greenhouse gases, they're somewhat immediate. We're starting to see them, but the biggest effects are going to, are going to be in the future. And so then if we discount them, we might argue, well, it's not worth it. We'll let our kids figure out how to deal with it. Let our grandkids figure out how to deal with it. Or if you, on the other hand, you think, oh, there's this risk of fat tails, i.e., you know, catastrophe to our children and our grandchildren, then we may say, we're not sure. There's a lot of uncertainty. But it still makes sense for us to do something now as a matter of insurance. And uh, so the economics of that question are hard. Yeah. <laughs> There's no question the economics of that are hard. But the science with regards to, to, to global warming, uh, while I'm not saying it's easy, I am saying that the results are relatively compelling. Uh, glo global warming is real. Humans are contributing to it. And... Uh, we have, we have a responsibility to try to deal with it. But what's wonderful about this is as we deal with it, as you already pointed out, only in the other direction, as we deal with that, we're also going to be dealing with some of our other air pollution problems. And there are lots of opportunities for substantial benefits of, of having economies that produce and thrive in such a way that we don't pollute the air and the atmosphere that we live in. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's more what I was trying to say is I feel like in terms of uh, a public ad adaptation, willingness by the public to do it, I think, you know, it's easy to show the cost of air pollution, the health costs, you know, you can show, hey, like, hey, if we clean this up, if we, you know, if we implement some smarter policies, if we, you know, do this or that. Uh, I feel like that's there's more public willingness adaptation to do it because the costs are more well understood, more clearly defined. And for me, it, yeah, maybe it's more of a an intermediate step to getting to like the larger step of like, hey, how do we control for greenhouse gases? How do we incorporate those costs? Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, I I think you're right. I mean, most. <laughs> Most, most most scientists would say, well, let's look at that. Let's look at the big issue and understand the, it, it, as well as we can. That's true too. But I do believe what you're saying is true, and that is is just our efforts to improve our air quality such that we don't have these health effects will will help and and probably help substantially with regards to reducing. Uh, our greenhouse gases and the impact on our on our on our climate. Yeah. Well, I guess time will tell. <laughs> <laughs> Doc, Dr. Pope, thanks a lot for coming on the the podcast. You know, it's great having you. Great catching up as well. Uh, it's good business. With you. You're you're fantastic. It's great. Well, it uh, certainly brings back a lot of memories of uh, being an undergrad, and so much appreciated. <laughs> uh, yeah, thanks again, and thanks everyone for listening. Take care. Bye. Yep. Bye.